Okay. Hi, everybody. I think we're going to get started. Um, so I want to welcome you to this panel. Um, this is weird for me because um, these are people from the scene that you guys love and want to hear about. But they're also two of my best friends. So I, when I was setting this up, I was trying to figure out how deep into the dirt I will go. So there'll be Q&A at the end. <laughs> And then you guys just kick me in the foot if I say something too personal or anything like that. But um, so um, I have the honor. Uh, if you don't know who I am, my name is Ryan Sands. I'm a publisher. I, I run Youth in Decline, um, which is a small comics press. And um, I have the pleasure of hosting, interacting, welcoming um, two people that you guys know and love. Um, on the furthest on my left is Michael DeForge. He is the author, oh gosh, okay. He's the, I'm not gonna list everything. We don't <laughs> <laughs> He's author of the Lewis series, Big Kids, Sticks Angelica, Dressing. He's currently working on Brat, uh, a daily Instagram series called Leaving Richards Valley. And um, just announced today is gonna be having a new book with Koyama Press called Our Western World. A Western World. Oh, A Western World. How dare you. <laughs> <laughs> I think. I suggested our Western world for the title, but you didn't go with it. Um, sorry. Oh, we're, we're friends if this is feeling weird already. I'm sorry. And then um, also on my left is Annie Koyama, um, founder, head of Koyama Press, um, which is my favorite press, doing some of the most interesting and exciting work um, in contemporary comics. Um, just this weekend, she had one of the craziest lineups, I think, of new books I've, I've ever seen at a show, um, including new books by Gigi, by Noel Freebert, by Connor Williamson, by Patrick Kyle, by Sophia Foster Domino, by Hannah K. Lee. Um, there's other books you may see up there, including new works by Eleanor Davis, Ben Sears. The list goes on and on. Um, so please join me in, in welcoming Michael and Annie. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so if you guys don't know, we're celebrating Koyama Press's 10th anniversary. There was a long panel yesterday where everyone came up and, and talked about Koyama Press and what it meant to them and, and Annie specifically. Um, I'm going to try not to get emotional during this speech, but um, I'm going to just try to talk a little bit about the sort of special relationship that is uh, Michael DeForge and Koyama Press. And, and um, I'm not going to self-insert too much, but um, I was there for a lot of these moments, so it feels very intertwined with my own personal like, story with comics. Um, I remember, I don't know if this is interesting to everyone except me, but we actually all met at the same TCAV. Right. Do you remember, what year was that? Do you remember? 2009, Nine, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think that's right. Yeah. And M Michael and I had been live journal friends for a long time, so I was like, I have to meet this like scary, greaser, cool guy. And I had heard about Koyama Press um, I think I actually hadn't heard of you yet. No, I met you at. I, I hadn't we hadn't really done anything. By no, no, that's right. We hadn't met yet. But um, so I, I know how I met Michael. But can you talk a little bit about um, maybe Michael? Can you talk about how did you meet Annie and um, and how did how did that first TCAP sort of turn into uh, into this long relationship? How did it start? Well, you flagged me down. I did because I had seen the Trio Magnus book around, um, and then but uh, I I didn't know Anne Koyama and but um, Facebook. So I knew what he looked like. Yes. And you walked by my Photos table. Photos of me existed. At yeah, the with his <laughs> pompadour, so he was easy to pick out. And I, of course, I yelled at him because I loved his gig posters. Yeah, and yeah, n not many people would have seen my comics at that point. Uh, no. That TCAF, I was giving a few out, um, but unless like someone was just scouring the small press section of the, <laughs> the old beguiling location, they they wouldn't have seen it. Um, but yeah, you flagged me down, and then. Um, uh, I think I emailed you like maybe a few days later because I was about halfway through lose number one at that point and I had saved up uh, enough uh, I was like working overtime hours to save up to self publish it but I showed you the pages and you had room in your schedule and uh, I had so much room in those days yeah. <laughs> yeah Annie can you talk a little bit at that point um, Koyama Press was really new did you have a sense of what you wanted to publish or or, or what, what the relationship would be like or what you were actually looking for I wanted to make art books mostly at the beginning but um, the two art book stores in Toronto the retailers they both closed that year so that was sort of okay that was like a hell what year else could, yeah it was Toronto. horrible <laughs> it was horrible and th that was when people were oh print is dead print is dead right, right. Mm -hmm. so uh, nobody likes a challenge more than I do so I know that print's not dead. It's still not dead today. So I was determined to make books. I always loved books. But our first meeting, I took you to Aroma, this little cafe. And at the end of the meeting, we didn't know each other. It was, you know, 
normally awkward. And then at the end, we were leaving, and you said, I was a dishwasher here. And then did you say, I had I been, got, fi I I had been fired. fired from that. <laughs> <laughs> so I happened to take him to the place where he had worked as a dishwasher and gotten fired. Yeah. That's what a power move that was. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and he still worked with me. Yeah. yeah that's, um, I, I have this um, photo I wanted to share that Annie sent Sorry. me. From the very this early. is one of my favorite photos, and Michael didn't know I was bringing it, so he's probably going to be mad. No, I saw but a pair there. This is yeah. like typical. This is when Michael was probably 21, and I was, you know, 28. This is our first time going down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We went to Chicago to Rude. meet his buddy Elio, uh, Chris Eliopoulos, mm -hmm. and this is our first time at Quimby's. So while well, Michael knows all that stuff on the shelves, it was still all brand new to me. That was a crazy trip. It was amazing. <laughs> it was fantastic. We ate our way through Chicago. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, and Michael, can you talk a little bit? Um, so you had already knew you knew you wanted to do this book called Lose. Yeah. At the time, but um, did you know what? Uh, did you want a publisher? Did you even know what that meant, or, or, or what were you thinking was going to come next? And then when you talked to Annie ab about the possibility, sort of, what were you thinking it would be? Um, I. I initially didn't have it in mind as like each one would be a floppy. I sort of had this idea that like lose number one would be a floppy, then number two would be like some stupid silk screen die cut thing, and then number three would be a newspaper or whatever. This was like when everyone figured out you could like print comics on newspaper for cheap. Right. And everyone was like, yep. We all need to print 3,000 issues of this <laughs> newsprint comic. Um, so I didn't really, I just wanted to put out the first issue. Yeah. And like I, my 21st birthday was coming up and I just was like, I need to like have something more than a mini. I wanna, so mm -hmm. I just wanted a, a floppy comic. And I was a thought like, that I should have this. Mm -hmm. I, I've been alive this many years. Like I just wanna <laughs> at least do, finish this. Um, but you did, you did decide to number it. So you, did you have a sense that it was gonna be a series or? Yeah, I just didn't know. I didn't have it in mind that each one would be the same format. I kind of just thought, like, I'll take it as I go, you know. Cool. I have, um, so I, the, uh, this is, um, for folks who don't know, this is pictures of the Lose series. This is issues two through seven? Yep. Yeah. Um, I think for a lot of people who are fans of your work, like, Lose was the, the one, the first thing where we were just like, holy shit, I'm going wait. Holy crap, who, uh, like, who is this person? I actually, I was looking through my email prepping for this, and I remember going home and emailing my friends in San Francisco, including Helen Joe and Calvin Wong, and being like, there's this guy, and there's this book called Lose, and you have to read it, and I actually brought copies back to show everybody. Um, and I, I think, um, yeah, it was just like a really, it was a really interesting and important part, I think, of your coming into the scene. So um, can you guys talk a little bit about the series, just sort of like, whatever parts of it you want to talk about, either the editorial process or sort of for those first couple issues. Um, how did you guys decide what to do with them? How, uh, how far in advance did you plan them? Or just, can you tell us a little bit more about the early parts of that series? Well, in those days, I was not beholden to a distributor or like anybody, a grant system where I had to print perfect bound books. And I grew up with floppies. Um, you know, that's what the only thing we had when we were little. So I always loved that format, but we could do whatever we want because I didn't have to care. I was using my own money that I'd made in advertising in a horrible job. I also played the stock market when I was sick for 10 years and did quite well. And then I was sick and I couldn't travel and use all those funds. And so I decided to funnel them into books and this kind of thing and supporting projects. So at first, I was funding projects where the, you know, basically I'd make a book or something and you could keep all the proceeds, but then um, that changed after yeah. a while. So there was basically no editing process, but I mean, Michael's work today is as professional as it was then. Yeah. You probably wouldn't agree, but aside from over that course of that series, yeah. maybe in the second one from the Writers Lose Three, mm -hmm. where the title's real small, even in those days, when I didn't know what I was doing, I knew that you probably would want to read the title, probably. So that was the extent of, hey, Michael, can you make the title a little bit more legible? And, but aside from that, you know, you have a real good sense of how to lay out a book, the order in which things go. So I can't add to it and make it better. I'm not a born editor. So, you know, why question an artist who's doing it better than you? Well, you have been exceedingly understanding. Of, I, I think at this point I have a reputation as being a fairly flaky artist. Like, I'll, I put out the books. You should but see the voodoo doll. <laughs> when he cancels the book on me, the, you know, <laughs> a month before I have to announce it. Yeah, like, I... I 
throw out a lot of work. And I think basically like issue three onward, they're, each of those comics has about like 20 to 60 pages drawn for it of like false starts or finished sure, stories sure, sure. that I didn't want to put in there. And yeah, I like, I think it was the Kid Mafia collection that I like had a bad dream and I, uh, I canceled it like, I, I, I was in, I was in a car this will be a therapy session in soon. New York. I was driving back from New York with like Patrick and a bunch, like Patrick Kyle and a bunch of other cartoonists and I like texted you or called you because I had a bad dream about it yeah. and I was like, I don't want to put I out a kid mafia book. I <laughs> well, I was, I, 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 I don't know if you know it, this, I, it's I, where I have to apologize, but for two of the lose issues that were thrown away it was because michael came and stayed with me either after a breakup or i don't we had a free week or i can't remember what it was and then would go to the coffee shop while i was at work and i'd come back and he would have thrown away the issue and so it happened twice while he was sleeping on my couch i was like is there like a is there like an evil spirit in the couch (laughs) that like is attacking michael's brain or i mean i i think all jokes aside though it's like it's become an important part of your process Mm. so um we're but you've been very understanding we, about yeah, it. Yeah, well, I'm like you in that I don't look back. If I'm finished with something, I, I just don't look back. I, I don't have the time personally, but I've always been like that anyway, so I don't have regrets about stuff. If Michael doesn't want to do it, why? If he can't be behind it, how can I be behind it 100%? I have to sell that book for years after yeah. he's way done with it, yeah, and yeah. he can choose not to like it. I don't get to not like it four years later yeah. when I still have stock of it. and. Uh, I still want to introduce, there are, believe it or not, people who don't know who he is. And so I'm still selling Lou's and Body Beneath where they're collected. So, yeah, I can't, I would never push you into that. You know that. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I think um, one thing I was going to talk about a little later, but I want to bring up now is um, I've learned a lot from Annie, like about how to be a publisher, about how to attack things in an ethical way but also to take it really seriously and I think um, something that came up a lot this year it, comes, it seems to come up every couple of years but is um, I always have this lightning strike of this thing Annie told me oh by the way when I started Youth in Decline um, I talked to my wife and she thought it was a good idea and then I called I asked Annie if I could talk to her on the, uh, on the phone and we talked for I think 40 minutes about everything it was like how do I do the money how do I do the books I didn't learn everything or take all of the advice but you basically like helped me feel confident to be able to do it so I, I want to thank you here for that but you also told me another thing you said um, don't don't work with assholes I yeah. said those words yeah <laughs> sorry I, it's, it's part of my mandate I, yeah. it used to be don't work with dicks yeah I'm sorry Life's too short um, if you, again, can't be behind a book and, uh, you know, because that person is whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't do a personality test or anything. Uh, if you've made over 100 titles, as I have, uh, you know, there's going to be a couple of people who will have been a little bit difficult to work with. Um, they're not evil by any means, but yeah, yeah, it, sure. it's, it's a different process with every artist you're with. Uh, Ed and I work very, very hard for all of them. Um, I think oftentimes they don't realize how hard we work and mm-hmm. all the stuff we do behind the scenes that is uh, pretty tedious and, uh, you know, it's not real fun to do, but it's part of the job. And so, you know, if you're going to commit to publishing people, you have to go all the way. Uh, um, you have to go all the way, especially when there's not a lot of money in the business. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I, to this day, don't work with assholes. This applies for any, anything that you have control over. Life yeah. is too short. Yeah, I, I, I went on a long Twitter screed about this based on our conversation in a way. But um, yeah, it was um, the thing I think people don't realize a lot about indie comics, too, is um, how much your personal life intertwines with this. Yeah. And I think like it's not just the money or the having to promote it for years, which is hard enough. But then we the, travel you, with them. I was just going to say, so yeah. We, yeah, I was going to ask you guys a little bit about that part of it. I mean, um, I think it's fair to say you guys have become very close like family mm-hmm. over time. Um, can you talk a little bit <laughs> about how uh, can you talk a little bit about about our little corner of indie comics, or, you know, or well, not just indie comics, but our, our side of the, this world where you have such an intimate relationship with the artists, and sort of, um, does that affect sort of the books you want to do? And, and how, how, does it, how does it feel, I guess, to have your professional life and your personal life so intertwined? You know, I'm an A-type personality anyway, so I can't separate stuff. Uh, I'm finally, after 10 years, trying to get my weekends back because if you don't stop me, I'll work every minute. Everybody in this room's probably had a 3 a.m. email from me. That's not unusual. I have insomnia, but also I like to work. I like to work because I like to work, but also I love my job. 
uh, after 10 years, I'm happy to get up most mornings. Mm -hmm. You know, there are the odd things. But to introduce to you a Hannah K. Lee or a Noel Freibert or, you know, people know Connor Williamson, I think. But that's the best part of my job. And then the other best part of the job that I didn't think of later on is that if you have working relationships with a Patrick Kyle, um, you know, Michael for 10 books or whatever, how many it is now, you grow with that person. I've gotten better at my job. I mean, okay, the bar was low. I didn't know anything. But I'm a fast learner, and I, I work to learn really, really hard. But the thing I am good at without that is that I know how to support people, mm. and I'm prepared to support people personally as well as from a low press. Yeah. So. And Michael, can you talk a little bit about what it's meant to you? I mean, I think we can sort of feel it from the things you've said before, but just what it's meant to you to have a publisher who's been so directly supportive and, and also just how do you think about it? I, I haven't really talked to you so much about the, the work-life balance, if that's a thing you think about, but. Oh, sure. I mean, it gets, always gets muddy in comics, but I feel so fortunate that I got to meet Anne because she, yeah, like she, without sounding too corny, she saved my life. Like I, I was in a pretty bad place. Uh, Lose was, I started Lose as a response to that. And um, mm. the fact that I could meet someone very supportive. And, and um, I like initially wasn't sure how to read you because I think my experience beforehand was in uh, like a lot of music. That was sort of the mm -hmm. illustration gigs I tended to get. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. And I was used to like promoters being crappy, you know? Of course. Like just promoters yeah. are, have a bad reputation. Yeah, and then, you're um, not the only one that's said that. And comics, it's, yeah, yeah. and comics itself has... I have to has, prove myself over and over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> and comics itself has a history of exploitation. For and sure. Sometimes it's not even yeah. malicious, like a lot of... Yep. In indie comics, it's like, you just don't know how to do any better. And the fact that um, I feel, like, very lucky that I got to meet Anne, and it, uh, she treated me really well, and it actually became a real friendship. It wasn't mm. just, like, a, a weird business arrangement or someone printing a book, and then I don't ever see it again, or, like, a, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, like I, I got to really grow. Um, yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say, um, I was, I was looking up stuff from when I first met Annie for this panel, and um, so I came out to TCAF and I met these guys, and Michael and I had been online friends, and I won't tell the story because too sad, but like I went, I came out here and I was like, I'm gonna go to TCAF, it's gonna be great, and everyone's, and I had a mini, I think, or I had just put out my first scene, and then um, Michael was in and I gave it to him and we talked, it was great, we hit it off, and then he went and did something, and then I was, I didn't have a table. And then at the end of the show, everybody was leaving to like go home. And then I, I like, people would split off and they were going to get pizza or whatever. And I just like went back to my hotel room. And I remember I was just like very alone. And I texted my girlfriend at the time and I was like, she was like, how was the show? I was like, oh, I met everybody, but like nobody knows me. I don't have any friends. And I was like, I think I'm just going to stay in and watch cable because I don't have cable. And then um, she's like, it's okay. No, like, they all like you. It's just everyone's awkward and people are really awkward in science fiction and comics. Don't worry. And then Michael <laughs> texted me and was like, oh, we're going to do this show. And so I, Patrick and Michael took me out. And, I, and then that was the beginning of like, oh, I felt like I belonged in comics. So it was really. But um, so I came back and I told everybody, like, there's all these cool people. And like, there's this woman, Annie Kuyama, and she's so nice and she really gets it. And like, it might have been the next year, actually. And then. Um, my, we were going to promote Michael's stuff at our show in San Francisco at Alternative Press Expo. And so it was me, Helen Joe, Calvin Wong, and I think Angie Wang. Maybe it was our sort of San Francisco crew. And because we were putting Michael's ta uh, books on the table, Annie wanted to pay for not just my part of the table as a thank you, but the whole table. And I was like, oh, uh, $200 is hard to come by. That's incredible. Oh, my God. So I emailed Helen, my friend, who's like one of my oldest friends, and was like, there's this person, Annie Koyama, and she's so nice. Oh, my God, she's going to pay for our table. We just have to rep Michael's books, and Michael's nice. And then Helen was like, who the fuck is this person? <laughs> <laughs> and why does she want to give us money? What is going on? And we had, to, we had to fight about it. Because I think people really are so not used to someone being that supportive. So um, I've run into that many times. Yeah, yeah, I think most but people I literally comments. have had to prove myself, even when I'm <laughs> trying to cover costs for people. Yeah. And people are used to always having strings attached when they're given something. Yeah. That's a very sad state if you think about it, but you can understand why it's a natural thing. Sure. If someone is trying to buoy you and uh, you know kickstart you up to the next level without any expectation of anything, uh, I get that. That's a weirdo concept and that doesn't happen every day. So but it's a weird thing to have to prove on the other end. Like, you know, 
I can't give you my first born. <laughs> yeah. But oh, what well, else can I show you? Well, I did want to ask sort of, a re I guess, kind of a related question. But um, I think a lot of the people in the audience are, are obviously fans of comics. Some I see some cartoonists out there. And um, it's kind of a question for both of you. But for Annie, first, um, I was curious, now that you've been doing this for so long and you've worked with a lot of different artists, um, do you have a sense of sort of, are there major sort of um, periods in an artist's development? And if there are, are what are the sort of the main problems that you think that artists have to sort of deal with or overcome? Maybe as like a new person who's trying to be seen, and then maybe after someone has a few books out and are trying to continue the work. Have, have you, do you have any sense of sort of the, the different challenges in the life cycle of an artist's career? The different challenge is that every single person in the room is different, and that yeah. um, th the trajectory of your career is going to be different for everyone. I mean, obviously, Michael, you know, went to the moon right away. That clearly doesn't happen with a lot of people, so I'm pushing, pushing the people who are steadily climbing. And uh, and then some year, one book will hit. Yeah. And they've had three books, but then it's the fourth book that hits. Uh, a lot of publishers might not stay that long and hang in and still have that faith with that person because they're not making enough Maybe they're not making their printing costs back. Mm. Uh, you can still believe in that person, but the business part, you know, your accountant is saying, nope, you got to cut that dude because they just, that book doesn't make any money. He's never going to, whatever. Uh, I don't like to be told what to do. So the I try and use the juvenile part of my personality and turn it into smart business practices. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mm -hmm. always work. But I have such a searing faith in everybody that I rep. Uh, frankly, I don't really give a shit if some of them don't sell more than 250 copies. It's more important that I get that work out there. Mm. If maybe someone else will pick them up, maybe the next book will you know, skyrocket, maybe they'll just have a real slow burn. It doesn't mean they don't deserve that chance. Yeah. And obviously no one else is offering to give them that chance. So that's why it's a good place to be. It's hard. I have to work like four times as hard to introduce a new artist mm -hmm. than, you know, if you had an Eleanor Davis. You guys already know the shorthand, um, mm. but I'm selling to salespeople at a distributor. I'm trying to get press on a new person they never heard of and they're spelling their name wrong and whatever. Uh, they can't get around the book. It's just harder, harder, harder. Mm. However, because I have to work nine times harder to bring out a Noel Freebird. Mm. Uh, once you know him, that's like really satisfying. When I see that spread, and next year, the next book that he does, people are like, oh man, I saw Old Ground, it was so fantastic, I cannot wait for his next thing. I don't care if there's 40 people saying that, because that 40 people next time will be 100 people. After that, there'll be like 500 people. So mm. if you have to have faith, and you have to have patience, and you have to be okay not making a crap ton back on, um, you know, early books. There's no other way to do it. I could pay, you know, publicists ten thousand dollars, and yeah, you know, they'll get a little bit more press. But the market is the same for mm. selling, so I'm not convinced that it would sell that many more books. Mm. But you know, frankly, there's not lots of us pushing new talent. And yeah. I, like, how do you start? Like, so many people. How do you start? I can't publish everyone. Yeah. Yeah, I was thinking recently that there's sort of like. The part that seems to be missing is um, a place for people to grow, like yeah. a short story market, yeah. or like a like. Yeah. Since a lot of the print publications have gone away, yeah, um, it feels like a lot of the big book, bigger some of the big publishers. I guess I'm thinking of like the big five and their subsidiaries. Like, they want someone who's that no one's ever published or heard of, mm -hmm. who has a finished 200-page graphic novel. <laughs> but like, not everybody is. Desha or Aisha Franz or Tilly Walden. Not so. everybody has a long story in them. Yeah, for, that's and interesting. Like sometimes never. Yeah. Uh, Michael's short stories, I maintain, are yes. just as good, like every single one of them, yeah. as his longer stories. Uh, there's a bias in the business that you know publishers only want long, you know, longer mm -hmm. stuff. It's harder to sell short stories and anthologies. I get that, but you know, I love both of those things, so I don't stop. Yeah. Um, Michael, can you talk a little bit about? Um, I don't know if you've thought through this too much, but like you used to table with the rest of us, and and then now you're Mr. Fancy, and you just show up for signings, and you don't. I tabled all decaf. <laughs> <laughs> Were you at your? Yeah, okay. No, but um, 
now now that you have a published uh, n- you know now th- now that uh i guess i more generally the question would be sort of has your relationship to the work changed at all like from the beginning meaning like what you need it to do or what you want to say or um ideally I, I would imagine the trajectory is as you sort of build a career you get more freedom or get to do whatever you want to do but um, i'm wondering if it's felt that way for you um i mean the, the difficulty is always just like maintaining everything. I think uh, one of the reasons it's been so valuable working with Koyama Press is that the investment Anne makes in her artists, um, she's always like looking towards sustainability. Like very early on you were um, concerned about like my physical well-being and mental health and in a way that was like you, you and, and you do this with all your artists where you want to ensure that they'll still be making work in like five or six years mm-hmm. and I think before you you know break in or do your first book or whatever um, there's so much emphasis. Like, I just want to break it. Like, once I break in, I'll yeah. be in. I've yeah, yeah, done yeah, yeah. the thing, and I'm in. I'm in the thing. Um, and once you're thing. in, you realize, like, oh, it's really hard is just, like, being alive another year and, like, doing another thing. So um, the fact that you're very invested in people in that way. Um, I do. I mean, I do other projects on the side because I know that it, it pays so little and takes so long to draw a comic that, you yeah. know, if I can get T-shirts made for you and you keep the proceeds or send you out on a tour, or send you to, to a residency, that kind of thing, you know, um, send you to ceramics class if you want to do something related. Everything you do is related. It's going to inspire you. Mm. So if you want to take up beekeeping, that's going to inform your comics. I know, it seems like a stretch. Uh, you know, you want to learn weaving or something. It's all related. If you want to go and study, you know, astrophysics, I'm going to try and help you and send you there if you can. That's going to inform your work. You you can't tell me that Th- it won't. Those are all things that Michael pursued. Yeah, I would I like know, to be right? an astronaut. Well, and, and like fail. <laughs> but, but <laughs> we're going to try baking next. Yeah, no. But yeah, not just with Michael. But yeah, I think you have to if you can and you have the resources, which I did more so in the early years, to support outside of mm. you know making one book. You have to do that because it's just too hard. It's hard to pay rent. Uh, where we live, the rents are they're crazy. Uh, you can't afford studio space. It's mm. Everything is against you to be an artist in Toronto, right? Yeah, it sucks too, because like, when I first came to Toronto, part of the appeal was that it felt like a cheap enough, like there was some mm-hmm. friction. It wasn't the mm-hmm. cheapest city, but um, mm-hmm. like part of what attracted me there was the comic scene, and part of what kept me there was like, yeah, I met you, and like um, I, had a, I already knew the Beguiling, and I had a great relation with Beguiling, and mm-hmm. Toronto itself has a history of all these cartoonists like Fiona Smith and Chester and Seth. Um, and I think now I... I you guys have had a really rough year, it seems like. Yeah, like we had a rough few. And this this year with uh, art spaces being more policed, um, mm-hmm. a lot of places closing, um, rents spiking really hard right now. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I have thought a lot of times, like if I was 19 again, yeah. I wouldn't have stayed in Toronto. Like, yeah, it mm-hmm. would be crazy. I get no, it's pretty yeah. criminal. It's there's no big picture looking ahead in politics in Canada as to you know if you kill the arts, what are you left with in a few years? Uh, San Francisco. Like well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. There's not enough forward. Yeah. I mean. Hurts, but it's true. Yeah. Not so funny. We're on our way. Yeah. There. Stop laughing. <laughs> 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 um, yeah. uh, I was gonna. Let's see. Um, Oh, I found, oh, I also found these old photos. Oh, Annie, you're cut off on that side. Oh, you're in. Oh, that's fine. I have hair in all these photos. Is that karaoke stuff on the left? Yeah, yeah, on the left. Um, oh, and then, oh, I was going to, oh, I had a picture, but I was going to share, but the other thing was, I was going to share a picture of one, another example of you, which is sending us all to, to lunch, but not being able to make it because you were working on picking up books. So this was another old photo of us for dim sum. Oh, my God. And the, the thing that's funny about this photo is, the person who pulled all these people together, the person who paid for the meal, and the person who sort of introduced us, couldn't make it because she was busy picking up books that day. Well, you coined the term, the term koyama. Oh yeah, oh, getting oh yeah, and getting koyama is finding out that the bill is paid <laughs> without but you even but realizing. Not there. Yeah. But these guys have gotten crafty, and they get me back now. Oh yeah, Robin we have like challenges, and yeah. <laughs> you guys are like bad now. They're good now. Yeah, they're like Robin fake, I like I fake going to the bathroom seven minutes into the meal, and yeah. then fight, and then yeah. fight the they waiter. Figured out all my tricks. Robin has a story where he like <laughs> stuffed the money in your mailbox what? or something. Like, <laughs> oh my god, you guys, it's crazy! It's, it's never born with these guys. I'll tell you, <laughs> you know, just the proximity of us all living. Patrick Kyle and Jeanette LaPalm and 
uh, Phil Woolham, Brian Dodgson, Robin Nisho, all in town, Julian Tamaki now, Ben Mara's here with us, and uh, it's a pretty nice community yeah. as long as they can afford to stay around, but yikes, yeah. every time one of them gets kicked out of their apartment, I fear for them staying in town, mm -hmm. uh, literally. Can I just say, because you put up a prose thing from Michael, yeah. something that I hope that one day Michael will do is a prose book, because I don't think people give him enough yep. credit for how good of a writer he is. He's always been a good writer, but he's really gotten like really good. I know you're not ready, and I know I've said it to you, but I mean, <laughs> I, uh, you, you know, can strong arm him a little like, bit here. We we have all. No, this. I'm I'm bossy, but I, he, he does it at his own time. But I I sure hope that within my lifetime, I'm going to read a prose book by Michael. Would you do that, Michael? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like the other person who tries to get Michael to do stuff he doesn't want to oh. do, so this is fun yeah. for me. I'm, I'm pretty stubborn. Are you having fun? <laughs> so are we, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I was gonna. I put this up. I was gonna mention a couple of things that Michael's done recently. Um, I feel like talking about your work, we would need many hours to go through everything. And um, but um, two things I want to call. I guess that you had done recently were these prose pieces. If folks haven't, you probably maybe haven't seen these in person unless you live in Toronto or caught Michael and grabbed his, back uh, his, his knapsack. But um, Michael created a series of um, pamphlets. Um, Stop sending me messages. How to draw my dog. What was the third installment? Uh, introduction to physical fitness. There you go. Um, and these were, these were left around businesses in Toronto. Um, and then another thing that you've been working on for a while that I, I, think, I think is very beloved. It's my favorite thing that's going on right now. It's um, Leaving Richard's Valley. Um, have folks seen Richard, Leaving Richard's Valley? Yeah, I see some nodding. Yes, Amazing. good. Um, yeah, and I guess I, I sort of, I mean, I've interviewed you a bunch of times and we're friends, so it's weird to ask you questions like this. But I was going to ask, um, the, the prose glossy pamphlets and now an Instagram daily comic, um, I just want to sort of ask or talk with the group a little bit about um, how intuitive is it the way you decide what to do next? And I guess what I mean is, do you think explicitly, here's what I've done before and I want to try something else? Or do you sort of intuitively respond to the projects you've done before? Or, or sort of, can you talk a little bit about how explicit it gets when you think about the next thing you want to do? Um, I do try to never repeat myself, so I'm intentional in that way. Um, it, it, just in basic, like, yeah. if I did something, if I just finished a big full color project, the next thing I want to start has to be black and white. Um, but I try to be pretty impulsive about it. Like, I started Richard's Valley um, because I had thrown out a book I was finishing for you, um, <laughs> which I can't even remember what it, oh, it was, I, the immediate future. yeah, all right, I, yeah. <laughs> I, threw, I gave up on a comic. Um, okay. And my day job had just ended. Mm. Um, and I thought, like, well, I have nothing now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I think that was what the email I got said. No, yeah. uh, I, I, um, <laughs> but I'd always wanted to do a daily strip. Yeah. But I always just thought, like, if I, like, it'd be great if I had, like, if I just, someone paid me to do a daily strip. I would love to do a daily strip. And I realized, like, well, no one's ever going to pay me to do a daily strip. Like, I'm not getting a United Features deal or something. Like, <laughs> so I, I decided that morning I would do it. And I, so I, I still try to be very impulsive. Like, I try to just be like, okay, this is what I'll spend the next year doing. Because... It yeah. usually like works out. And you're on like number 200 and what was today? 260. I'm in the 260s. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Do you have a sense of how far it'll go? Um, is there an end to it? I know in the past you've said you kind of wanted to have something you could just do forever. I would like to do this forever. I will not be able to afford to do it forever, but I would like to do it forever. And do you mind? I mean, I don't know if this is too. You guys should just go like this if this is boring or something. But um, I like this stuff. Um, how do you structure getting it done? Like this weekend we're here at SPX. I'm, unless you're unless you're drawing it in the mornings. No, I did a few in advance. Okay. This. I just do the next days every... I just have one done uh, a day in advance. Do you do it at the same time every day? Do you like get up, go to the bathroom, get a coffee, write a Richard, Leaving Richard's Valley? I run Draw Richard's Valley, and then I spend the rest of the afternoon doing whatever. Okay, awesome. Yeah. But the, the pamphlets was a lot different. Like, the pamphlets were... Um, that was a, a very, like... I had been spending a lot of time really disliking putting so much stuff online. I like, I still like putting stuff, I clearly yeah. still enjoy putting stuff online, but I hate how like freely available uh, comics seem to need to be. Yeah. And I thought it'd be funny to do something where like you just have to be in this laundromat in Toronto to enjoy this. <laughs> and if you're not there, 
you don't get it. And it's free. It's easy to find if you happen to be there or whatever, but it's like, like I like the, the local aspect of that. I, I, I really just wanted to do something that like, and they're, um, I don't hide that I make them, but they're, they're not credited. They're anonymous yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of. And I like the idea of like, like a lot of my, the most memorable experiences with art is stumbling across something and not yeah. really being able to explain it or source it even. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was like, I want to just do something like that, like the, the way I used to enjoy being surprised. So. And I like in the midst of like Rizograph year three or seven or whatever, Ron, you did a gloss, you did a high gloss, high right. gloss pamphlet. It's really, to make a thousand pamphlets, it's like a hundred bucks. That's great, yeah. Like, no one should be printing comics. It's, it's, so, it's so much cheaper. Um, do you want to talk about the Deep Web comic, or is that a secret for now? Oh, yeah, I'm going to do a comic. I, was, I sort of was like, the biggest dick move would to, like, I should ask you if I can make the next issue of Lose this. I knew. I, I just want to make the next coming. A comic that's only available on the Deep Web. <laughs> through, like, GPS coordinates. Like, yeah. the way people you have to, like, bring like your geo key. And, yeah, oh, God. Okay. Cool. As a fan who doesn't live in Toronto, I love that. Uh, <laughs> um, so we're going to have a little time for questions, but I have a couple, a couple more for you guys. Um, it's not, hope, I'm not trying to get you guys to, we'll see if I can get you guys to say something funny. But um, Annie, if you could make Michael do whatever you want, and, without, and assuming he'd, he'll do it and not fight you, what would be your dream project that you could get Michael to do? Well, if he's never going to pick up Kid Mafia again, which I, I am, I'm okay with now, but I was like crying. My friend Sean wanted to make a film of Kid Mafia. He's still crying. Um, I'm okay with letting go stuff that Michael wants to let go. Uh, I want to see him do more art projects. I'm pushing him like every time I see him to, and I'm prepared to fund this kind of thing. I can't do it within the press. But uh, he had a great art show in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. uh, a couple years ago, and uh, probably is it was in Ottawa a couple years ago, and you know how many people saw it? Not a ton of people. Uh, he's so capable of doing anything he wants that I feel like a, a show that could tour, mm. maybe with a print component, but probably not. I, I don't care if it's puppets or something, or uh, look has the capacity to make a film with all his friends. Uh, you could do anything you set your mind to do, uh, but I'd want the DeForge stamp on it so you would know it was his stuff. Mm. You would know anyway. I wouldn't even have to say that. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to see him go sideways because clearly his comics, are, uh, what can I say? Uh, he doesn't need help from me for that. But you would need funding help to do these kind of things. So I'm pushing him to do that. Yeah. I know it's coming. Yeah. I can be patient. <laughs> okay, and Michael, I can't, I can't imagine Annie hasn't let you do the th whatever you wanted to do generally, but... Um, if you could do any book or any project for Cuyama Press, no strings attached, no timeline attached, no funds limit attached, what would you do? That's what would thing, you like to do? Is that I have this conversation sometimes, not just in the context of, but just like, what's your dream project yeah. as yeah. an artist? We've yeah. had that talk. And it really is always just like the next comic. Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm living my dream. Like, I just want to draw comics. <laughs> like, I, yeah. I like doing other stuff, and I, I like challenging myself. Um, yeah. I really enjoyed working on that art show, and I got to work with Phil Wollum on some sculptures, and I, yeah, I do hope to do more things like that. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in animation and all these other different mediums. Um, like, I wrote a musical last year, and it's like, yeah, well, maybe I'll get around to <laughs> figuring out how to, like, do that. But um, There's that 8-bit that eight right? album that you made. Uh, yeah. That, I have that. Well, on my, yeah, yeah, yeah. an old one. But <laughs> I just, I just want to draw, like, okay. a comic. That's all I really want to do <laughs> and that's that seems so Mission hard accomplished. yeah that seems hard enough though right it's like yeah that's already like that's already difficult yeah. like, so once i get good at that then i can like figure out the other stuff okay i can't wait for you to get good at comics that'll be really cool <laughs> um so um before we take some questions i just wanted to also highlight um sort of a, a nice surprise today as part of the weekend um Kuyama press announced their spring books so um I was going to share some of these here. So Alex Deegan is doing a new book. Thanks, um, Tom Spurgeon. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thanks, Tom Spurgeon. Uh, and Fiona Smith, Jessica Campbell, Michael Como, Ben Sears. And then also announced was, yes, Michael's new book. <laughs> Another book from Michael, uh, Western World. Um, just for a few minutes, not to put you on the spot, but can you tell us a little bit about the book and, and what it's going to be? Yeah, it's um, a bunch of short stories. Uh, I was, I was when compiling all of them. Um, 
I'm like suddenly like, is this gonna age well? Like I feel like this is definitely a bunch of short stories written in 2016 and 2017 or <laughs> like very, uh, but yeah, it's all, uh, I think it's a lot about um, the living arrangements of groups of people, I think. <laughs> yeah, um, and it's folk color. It's, it's hard to talk about a short story collection. I understand. It's like, sure, there's sure. one story about dogs. And like, there's one story about Is there a story about dogs? <laughs> yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> um, okay, cool. Um, so we have time for questions if anybody has. I have more, but like I wanted to share a little bit. So um, <laughs> if anybody has a question for Annie or for Michael, please, um, please actually go to the microphone so we can pick you up um, on the recording. Hey, um, yeah, kind of about like your day job. What is life like now that you're not working on Adventure Time? Has it shifted your kind of how you create stuff and like what, like, because you're, I guess you're not being paid to do all the Adventure Time stuff now. Is, has that changed your workflow at all or anything like that? Or Well, that's why you? I started the Daily Strip, um, was that I had saved enough that I didn't have to panic. And I thought, well, now's the time to do this. Right. Hmm. Um, but I don't know yet. This is like a transitional year. Totally. So next year I might like be dishwashing again or something. But I don't mean that in like a negative, like I, I just I'll probably like pick up a, a side gig again or something. So I've been trying to take advantage of the year while seeing what's gonna shake out next year. Yeah, yeah, thanks. <laughs> cool. <laughs> no, you don't get to leave yet. Does anyone else have any questions? I had another question, I guess. Um, this is sort of a tangent, but um, Annie, I know re uh, this was since the last time we saw each other, but you, it was announced that you had donated your personal art collection. The U.S. portion of it. The U.S. The portion. Billy yeah. Ireland Museum yeah, in that, Columbus. Yeah, yeah. Can, well, can you talk a little bit uh, either about, about that or just in general? I know over, over time you've, both through the books you've created and then the personal work that you've collected, you sort of have a huge snapshot of the, the 2000s and this art scene. I think so. I, I have a pretty good one. I mean, it, it started with just supporting artists who couldn't get to a show or couldn't pay their rent. So how can you help them out is to buy a page from them. Mm. At a good price, though, because, I mean, I had to tell some of them, honestly, you can't charge $15 for this. I remember fighting with Jim Rugg and saying, man, that's that's too cheap, and he's like, no, no, it's I want it to be affordable. I'm like, I want it to be affordable too, but you're doing a disservice to all the other artists who are selling their pages too, because mm. if you're letting these go for this, then the next, you know, Kevin Heisinger can't charge more for his because they'll go, oh, I just bought Jim Rugg's space for this, and you know, mm. why should yours be fifty dollars more? So you know, nobody talks to each other in comics apparently. So it started that way, and then. A few years ago, I decided it was selfish to sit on this stuff and only be able to look at it when I could share it with everybody who could go to Columbus and anybody can see that stuff. So I worked really hard in a pretty concerted way since then to collect more. I'm still doing it um, judiciously now. Hmm. Um, however, because I'm in Canada, I would rather keep my Canadian collection, which includes Michael, of course, yeah. uh, in Canada as much as I can. Mm. If I cannot find an institution to donate it to um, that will make it accessible to anybody in this room who wants to go see it, mm. that may end up in Columbus, too. Cool. And you, I'd you, be okay with that. Your collection is, like, insane. Well, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it wasn't... I, I never set out to be a collector of anything except tacky salt and pepper shakers. That's what I have. That was also <laughs> yeah. an insane collection. Oh, yeah, okay. So, I mean, you know, A-types, you know, you don't stop at three. So, yeah, my motivation to collect was... It wasn't to be a collector. It was to help artists. Um, yeah. To this day, it still is. But uh, when I do this, I get their permission, even though I own those pages now. Mm -hmm. So if I were to buy from you, Hannah, I would pay you the going rate for it, and then I would ask you if you would be cool with me donating it, and then, you know, you would get the credit, and then your grandkids mm -hmm. can go and see it, you know? When I'm long gone, uh, the stuff should be open to everyone. I know most collectors like to sit on stuff. Mm -hmm. I get it. I, I understand yeah. that collectors like to sit on stuff and hope that it will be worth more money and then they can uh, sell it later and you know, pay for their kids college. I get that and there's nothing wrong with that. But mm. if I can get as many people in our little you know, niche into one place yeah. where uh, it's a heavily funded place that I know is not gonna go under in five mm. years, 
Uh, that was another thing when I quizzed them. I said, well, what happens if you close in five years? I mean, this collection, it's not about how much money it's worth. It's, I don't want it to suddenly not be accessible to mm -hmm, people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that was the deal breaker for me. And um, they've convinced me enough that um, it's a good place to have it. Great. It feels uh, pretty good. Yeah, I was I got I was like oh I wasn't planning to donate my stuff but then I've started <laughs> I started talking to my wife I think we want to wait until our daughter can look at it a little bit and then I think we're gonna totally. follow suit in the future so yeah, it's I a mean, really inspiring thing you did I, yeah well, it, uh, I won't lie it's um, I have some chronic illness and I don't know how much time I have um, and so I would like to do it while I'm alive and I just want people to be able to go like now and yeah. see stuff so um, it's, it's great there's the institutions way. who can actually support that yeah it is there are not lots though so if anyone knows of any Canadian fabulous place that'll let you all come and you know see a Michael DeForge thing on a Thursday morning um, please get to me because I've reached out and I can't find a place like that yet mm -hmm. um, does anyone else have any other questions I think we have time for like one or two more and then that'll be the end so yeah please go to the mic yeah we have just a few minutes you, you can go to if you want. Hi, uh, my question is for Michael. Yeah. Um, I, you, I guess, famously like are prone to disposing of your work, throwing your work out that you don't like. Um, what is, I guess, is there a difference for you between? Um, do you have a, a positive affirmation for your work? Like, is it like, how do you decide this is what I like versus this is what I don't like? This is what I want to put out, and that's what I don't. Uh, I guess, is it more pruning or is it more? the growing process, I guess. I just sort of think of it as editing. Mm -hmm. Like it's, um, yeah, like if it took four pages to get to the one page, uh, that's good. I just think of it that way. So I, I don't, it's not actually like a big dramatic thing where I'm like throwing pages <laughs> in the fire and like I'd strip off all my clothes. Like I just, <laughs> sometimes you look at the thing and it just, you realize it doesn't work or like it's fine but maybe not super challenging. I, I try to have this uh, attitude of like, a page might be fine, or a comic might be fine, but like, does it need to see print? Like, is it, maybe it's fine just as like a thought I had, or like a, and I do value mm. that process of, mm. like, I, yeah, I think of it just as working through ideas. Cause it's all digital too, so literally it would just be you <laughs> moving the mouse yeah, and going, I just, <laughs> Yeah, um, yeah, I do try to like make sure they're, the high res are gone forever though, so it's like, I don't, I'm not tempted, but. Um, you used to email them to me, and then you realize that I keep them all, so. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I, yeah, I just I think of it as editing. So it's it's uh, uh, and usually an idea that I throw out. It just like needs more time in the oven, and it'll make its way into something. Like all, all the kid, uh, the two like worthwhile kid mafia characters became characters in uh, Brat. So like, and it's like a corrected version of them or something. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, this is actually what I wanted to do mm -hmm. with these two. So cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Hi. <laughs> um, Michael, I was wondering if you could talk about what your like day-to-day -day was like, maybe like fresh out of school, kind of before you had like a name for yourself, how you kind of balanced like working to just pay the bills, but also finding time to like push your artwork. Um, yeah, I didn't, I sort of like really gracelessly kind of flopped around. I think some of it, I, I didn't go to art school. I dropped out of a philosophy oh. program and um, I wasn't sure like, I'm still unsure like what the arc of an illustrator is supposed to look like or like what the um, so I, I mostly just like did kitchen and warehouse jobs um, but I, I don't sleep a lot so it actually kind of worked out pretty well where uh, it was easy to to work like a like push a bunch of boxes around and your brain is off and um, the, the whole time you're kind of like geared up to, to draw when mm. I'm back home so it, it uh, I tried to have at least structure my life in a way where I could have three or four hours to draw at least, even if I, I worked a full day mm -hmm. in the mornings or in the evenings. Um, yeah. And I still even, uh, between like work I do, like formerly Adventure Time and now freelance illustration and other things, I, I try to make sure a certain percentage of my day is spent uh, drawing comics um, versus uh, commercial work, and if the ratio ever gets too imbalanced, it means like I agreed to do too much, or I need to like switch apartments, or 
cancel like a Netflix subscription or something. <laughs> I just, like have to re refigure the algorithm or something. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the time we have. So um, could everyone just join me in thanking Annie Koyama and Michael DeForge? Thank you.